Due to the graphic nature of this cult's crimes, listener discretion is advised. This episode includes discussions of graphic material that some people may find offensive. We advise extreme caution for listeners under 13. A cold night in London, 1999. Outside the Royal Albert Hall, a British protester hands pamphlets to those lining up to see the one the Sahaja Yogis call Mother. Four Sahaja Yogis surround the protester and rip the pamphlets from his hands. They threaten to smash his face in. They are Sahaja warriors and will fight anyone who dares to disrespect their mother. The protester flees. He makes it several blocks, about to turn down an alleyway on his way home, but a feeling of dread overtakes him. He turns to see one of the Sahaja warriors is following him. He sprints for the nearest telephone box. As the protester slams the door shut, the Sahaja yogi thrusts his arm inside. The protester bashes the door against the yogi's arm until he backs off. The protester panics and calls the police for help. The yogi disappears. The protester realizes this was a planned ambush. A chill skitters up his spine as he wonders what would have happened if he had turned down that dark alley alone. Hi, I'm Greg Polson. And I'm Vanessa Richardson. And this is Cults. Today we continue our deep dive into the Sahaja Yoga movement, founded in 1970s India by Sri Mataji Nirmala Devi, the venerable Great Mother Immaculate Goddess. She expanded her following throughout the 1980s and 1990s with a combination of Indian mysticism and maternalism. You can listen to previous episodes of Cults, as well as all of ParCast's other shows, wherever you listen to podcasts. A new episode comes out every Tuesday. A lot of people ask us how they can help support the show. And if you enjoy the podcast, the best way to do that is to leave a five-star review. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and on Twitter at ParCast Network. In part one on the Sahaja Yoga movement, we focused on the life of Sri Mataji, born on March 21, 1923, in Chindawara, India. As a child, she experienced many close calls with death. As she grew older, she developed aspirations for medical school and worked as an Indian nationalist. Finally, we covered the founding of Sahaja Yoga on May 5, 1970, a religious movement that believed its disciples could channel vibrations to achieve spiritual enlightenment. In this episode, we'll turn our spotlight to these disciples. Who were they? Why does Sahaja Yoga continue to prosper with an estimated 30,000 to 100,000 members worldwide today? despite allegations of child abuse, tax evasion, and harassment from ex-disciples. How has the cult fared since Sri Mataji's death in 2011? On April 5, 1991, in Cairns, Queensland, Australia, Sri Mataji and her brother H.P. Salve, better known to the Sahaja Yogis as Baba Mama, had a taped conversation. In the video, Sahaja yogis tend to Sri Mataji's feet as she speaks to Baba Mama, who remains off-camera throughout. Baba Mama mentions an unnamed male Sahaja yogi who claimed his vibrations were so strong he could describe the house of a person he has not visited. Sri Mataji dismissed the Sahaja yogi's claims. Why would anyone need to describe someone else's house? It was a useless thing to do with one's vibrations, she said. Baba Mama agreed it was a misuse of power. Sri Mataji pondered, quote, how many unnecessary things we do. We are like monkeys in a way, end quote. She goes on to tell a story about a monkey entering their room. The monkey stole a shoe. Sri Mataji found another shoe and threw it on the ground. The monkey copied her. Brainless creatures, Sri Mataji laughs. Baba Mama, also laughing, agrees. And that's how we follow fashions, says Sri Mataji, because we are brainless. This exchange between Baba Mama and Sri Mataji sums up her relationship with the Sahaja Yogis. She appreciated their devotion, but didn't like it when a disciple acted above their station. How dare this boastful Sahaja Yogi assume that he could ascend to her level? 
How dare he try to show off with tales of unnecessary feats? He was just a monkey. And when monkeys see, monkey do. It's difficult to say how much the cult grew throughout the years. Researcher Judith Coney had attempted to collect data on Sahaja Yoga, but admits that her findings were incomplete, and her numbers were likely inaccurate as a result. We can confirm that the numbers were significant enough for Baba Mama to launch a music career, starting in 1987. Composing songs in Urdu, Baba Mama started releasing songs under the alias Bellas. He also formed a band called Nirmal Sangeet Sarita and founded a Nagpur Music and Fine Arts Academy. His band, Nirmal Sangeet Sarita, would perform at many worldwide celebrations for Sri Mataji. In videos of their performances, many Sahaja Yogis are singing and clapping along. When the Sahaja Yogis weren't rejoicing through song and dance, their place was at Sri Mataji's feet. However, a group of disciples had grown disillusioned over time with Sahaja Yoga and decided to leave. Their stories would expose the darker side of the movement. The following is the account of Cynthia Delonas, an ex-disciple who, along with her husband Nick, left the movement after a decade. Growing up in the 60s and 70s, Cynthia was raised in a liberal environment. Both of her parents worked, which was an anomaly at the time. They encouraged Cynthia to follow her heart, her dreams, and her own spiritual path. Cynthia met Nick in college, and like most couples, they had a lot in common. Most notably, quote, a desire to look deeper into our lives and try to understand the meaning of our existence, end quote. After graduation, they moved to Boston and happened upon an advertisement for a seminar in Cambridge. It sounded interesting, so off they went. We arrived at the meeting place. There was quiet Indian music playing and incense burning, Cynthia recalls. They took off their shoes and sat down. Everyone's attention was focused on a small table with a photo of Sri Mataji, illuminated by a lit candle. Cynthia recalls, quote, The music was lowered and eventually turned off. We meditated for some time and were encouraged to see if we could feel a cool, breezy sensation either across the palms of our hands or above our heads. I couldn't be sure exactly what I felt. I only knew it felt peaceful, end quote. The seasoned yogis went around the room to bless the attendees as they meditated. When the seminar ended, Nick was flushed with excitement. Cynthia, however, wasn't completely sold. The Sahaja yogis told Cynthia not to worry if she couldn't feel the breezes just yet. She would eventually. According to authors and American spirituality experts Joel Kramer and Diane Alstad, having experienced disciples recruit newcomers helps keep the disciples trapped within the cult. Vanessa's going to take over on the psychology here and throughout the episode. A reminder, Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, but she has done a lot of research for this show. Thanks, Greg. Kramer and Alstad write, quote, through being in focus of attention and holders of mysterious knowledge, the more this makes them, the wooers, feel special, end quote. As for newcomers like Cynthia and Nick, the exclusive attention they received likely fed into their shared desire for a purpose. Kramer and Alstad said, these good feelings further reinforce their conviction of being on the right path. Cynthia married Nick in 1983, that same year, on March 4th, Sri Mataji gave a talk in Adelaide, Australia. In her speech, Sri Mataji described an ideal disciple thusly, quote, You don't think for yourself, and the words, I think, should be dropped completely from Sahaja Yogis, end quote. A statement that would foreshadow what Cynthia Nick would experience during their time in Sahaja Yoga. As both college grads and newlyweds, the couple were likely unsure of where to go next. Kramer and Alstad say that during these uncertain times of upheaval, gurus become especially appealing because they provide stability, an anchor for a life that otherwise feels chaos. Sahaja Yoga provided all the answers, and they were in the right state of mind to jump on board. Throughout this time, Cynthia and Nick were discovering the ins and outs of the movement, or so they initially assumed. They were taught that in order to lead a dharmic life, they would have to make some major lifestyle changes. Once they officially chose Sahaja Yoga, the couple would learn what it would take to be true disciples. 
Kramer and Alstad refer to this as surrender, a word that will reappear as we examine the guru-disciple relationship. In Sahaja Yoga, Srimataji taught disciples like Cynthia and Nick to surrender their willpower. This is presented as necessary for the guru to lead the disciple to realizations that can only be achieved by giving up the mundane attachments previously accumulated. What were some of the mundane attachments the couple had to part with to become Sahaja Yogis? Well, drinking wine was not allowed. It was bad for the vibrations. Television was also forbidden. Women weren't allowed to wear certain types of pants, especially jeans. Black clothes were prohibited. The color attracted negativity. The women also had to wear their hair short, no bangs or fringes. The women were also not allowed to have their hair trimmed by non-Sahaja yogis, or non-realized souls. Cynthia admits she cheated on this rule. The Sahaja yogis mainly listened to Indian music. Music by the Doors, Blue Oyster Cult, Frank Zappa, and Led Zeppelin were prohibited, as they were against the spirit. However, Cynthia recalls with amusement, Sri Mataji permitted Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven, as she was convinced the song was about her. Their food was also regulated. Cynthia says, We ate no beef, chocolate, mushrooms, blue cheese, ice cream, peanut butter, and an assortment of other things. According to Kramer and Alstad, surrendering to a guru can be gradual, like peeling an onion, as people surrender more and more over time. The rigidity of the Sahaja Yoga regimen was necessary for surrender to work. The guru gives disciples something to strive for and strings them along with carrots or rewards. Cynthia and Nick persevered, and their carrot was an invite to a Boston Sahaja Yogi ashram, which is Hindi for a secluded residence. Cynthia and Nick would live in the ashram for the next two years. By day, Cynthia was a successful copywriter. By night, she was a pious Sahaja Yogi. Her two lives clashed constantly. Fellow copywriters stopped inviting her out as she always turned them down. Despite the rules, she was able to successfully argue for television, as Cynthia needed to watch the commercials her co-workers wrote. However, she had to watch on mute. Sometimes the television was shut off right when Cynthia was in the middle of a commercial. This naturally upset Cynthia, who contributed the television and other furnishings to the ashram. Complaining, however, was impossible. When Cynthia objected to the abuse of the furniture, the other Sahaja yogis attacked her faith. She was too materialistic, they said. However, the surrender Sri Mataji demanded from her Sahaja yogis wasn't limited to possessions. Cynthia and Nick were encouraged to cut ties with their families and bond with other disciples. Once a week, they wrote letters to fellow Sahaja yogis from all over the world, a sort of pen pal program. In addition to the weekly seminars, there were pujas, or worship sessions, bhajans, or musical sessions, and visits to other ashrams. Cynthia and Nick would travel to New York, Toronto, San Diego, Ohio, and New Jersey. According to Kramer and Alstad, what such sharing really amounts to is a more oblique form of proselytizing that cleverly accomplishes several things. Specifically, disciples like Cynthia and Nick were removed from everyone except their fellow Sahaja yogis. Factor in the need for human contact, and it was only natural for the disciples to seek each other out. They were likely unaware of it at the time, but the more the Sahaja yogis isolated themselves, the stronger their ties to the cult and to Sri Mataji became. We'll return to our story in just a moment from the Parcast Network. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. 
Hi there. I'm hosting a brand new show on Parcast called Mythology. It dramatizes ancient myths for a modern audience and dives into their history, origins, and meaning. I've already listened to part one, and I can't wait for part two. Stick around after this episode to hear a preview of Mythology's part one on the Greek goddess Athena. New episodes come out every Tuesday. Search for and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. Now, our story continues. Nick and Cynthia were falling deeper into the throngs of Sahaja Yoga. A puja Cynthia and Nick would have likely attended took place in New Jersey on October 27, 1985. Though we can't confirm that the couple attended this event, we can assume they were subjected to multiple tirades about the evils of ego from Sri Mataji. People with egos were left-sided, driven by their baser interests. Sri Mataji railed against left-sided people who might attempt to enter the ashram. She warned that they would appear nice, quiet, and sweet. Then, the boots inside them will slowly aggress the other members. In Indian mythology, a boot is a spirit or demon, and Sri Mataji had plenty to say about boots to her disciples. In short, a boot was anyone who doubted Sri Mataji. Again, it all ties back to surrender, according to Kramer and Alstad. Quote, some gurus could be aware that they're manipulating people to surrender, but think they're doing so for their own good, end quote. Labels like boot work to make Sahaja yogis protect themselves from perceived outsiders. It also allowed the disciples to weed out the skeptics among them. Sri Mataji specifically told her Sahaja yogis to stay away from any boots, including their spouses. The fear of exclusion likely made Cynthia and many others stay quiet. On the surface, Cynthia appeared devout. Despite her fear of public speaking, she was strongly persuaded into leading a meditation seminar once every 10 days. Yet the submissive role of women in Sahaja Yoga troubled her. Cynthia shared her doubts with no one, not even her husband. It wasn't just the fear of the boot label. In a June 19, 1988 seminar, Sri Mataji recounted how a negative female Australian yogi formed a group with other negative women. Their combined bad energy was so devastating that, according to Sri Mataji, they destroyed all the vibrations in the Australian ashram. Anecdotes like this help persuade Cynthia to hold her tongue. Sri Mataji could also be very anti-American in her diatribes saying that the reason the United States was in spiritual chaos was because of their women. Despite this being openly misogynist, Sri Mataji would justify it by reminding her followers that their own guru was a woman. Having been conditioned for years to surrender her autonomy to Sahaja Yoga, Cynthia didn't want her negativity to ruin the Americans' vibrations. It wouldn't be fair to undo her fellow disciples' hard work. Sri Mataji said, to be a good disciple, first of all, you have to be an excellent wife. A bad woman and a bad wife is very much more detrimental than a bad man. So, as Nick enrolled into Boston University for a master's degree, Cynthia played the dutiful wife and privately sought an escape. They were talking about buying a home and starting a family. Cynthia hoped this would be their ticket out. However, once they were homeowners, Cynthia and Nick found themselves hosting other Sahaja yogis. Women in Sahaja Yoga were also responsible for keeping their husbands in line and close to the faith. They were expected to help their husbands grow in their faith, with no expectation for reciprocated support. For Cynthia and Nick, this also meant the couple had to turn their new home into a Sahaja Yoga center. They took care of their fellow disciples together and couldn't refuse any visitors. In 1989, Nick graduated, and Cynthia gave birth to their first child, a girl. She took their daughter to every puja and seminar. A baby takes an enormous amount of support, and having isolated herself from the rest of the world, Cynthia would have likely been scared, and despite previous misgivings, she kept turning to Sahaja Yoga. Kramer and Alstad note that cults provide the comfort of certainty to their disciples. Sahaja yogis like Cynthia didn't need to worry about parenting with such a huge built-in support system. Then, in 1992, Cynthia and Nick learned they were expecting triplets. 
the Sahaja Yogi saw this as a blessing from Sri Mataji and showered the couple with gifts. Cynthia recalls, I knew I was going to be okay because so many people obviously cared for me. By 1993, Cynthia and Nick had been Sahaja Yogis for nine years. Their cramped house was in the center of a crime-ridden area, yet they couldn't move. Cynthia said, The housing market in Massachusetts was in a terrible state. As they searched for a new home, the couple had a decision to make. Sri Mataji told her disciples on March 20th, 1993, quote, Sahaja Yoga is all a divine plan, but in your case, it is your own decision, end quote. After years of internal struggle, Cynthia and Nick made the decision to leave Sahaja Yoga. They slowly faded away from the ashram. Their attendance at the pujas waned until they finally stopped coming. Cynthia has since said that her children were the true catalyst for their leaving, as they didn't want to raise their four children in this freakish manner. The freakish manner, Cynthia refers to, is the Sahaja yogis shipping off their children to the International Sahaja Public School. Remembering how the other parents said goodbye to their kids, Cynthia knew she didn't have it in her heart to send her children away. Other ex-Sahaja yogi parents had a different take on the situation. An ex-Sahaja yogi parent offered, quote, When one is told by the goddess that it is in the best interest of your child that they should not be around your poor vibrations, you accept this, end quote. Kramer and Alstad note that a disciple's willing surrender doesn't mean that the disciple loses control. Instead, they transfer their control to the guru. In the case of the Sahaja yogis, to surrender to Sri Mataji meant to give up their parental authority. The Sahaja yogis who sent their children overseas came to regret their decision. Alastair, an ex-Sahaja yogi, said, My daughter's grades were very poor, and when we picked her up on her annual holiday, she had lice and her clothes were tattered and dirty. Another mother recalled sending her 13-year-old daughter to the International Sahaja Public School. Her daughter and several other students had to steal food or otherwise subsist on rice and chapatis and unleavened Indian flatbread. The inconsistent diet caused her daughter to stop menstruating. The anonymous mother said, quote, What today still troubles my daughter the most is that one of the teenage boys was repeatedly molested during the night by Sir Raja, the music teacher, end quote. Not only did Sir Raja teach but he was also the head of the senior boys' dormitories and their spiritual advisor. Lance, a graduate of the International Sahaja Public School, recalls, he was very overly friendly with all the boys. He was constantly hanging about our rooms. He acted like a big brother to many of us. Sam, a former student, recalls the incident that started it all. He and an unnamed friend were startled by a cacophony in the hallway. They ran outside to see Sir Raja and his wife fighting with two students, an unnamed Swiss girl and a boy named Miles. Sam and his friend watched as Mrs. Chitnavis, the school principal at the time, escorted the four into her office away from prying eyes. The next day, Sam took the Swiss girl aside and asked what had happened. The Swiss girl said that Sir Raja molested Miles during music practice. Miles told the Swiss girl, who told Sir Raja's wife. Sadly, there were other victims, but the exact number remains unknown. Lance, who also noted that Sir Raja was not the only abuser on campus, said, I suspect there were ones that will not say anything about it. I do remember two other teachers that kissed and touched the girls very inappropriately, often in front of the whole class. Several European Sahaja yogis brought the matter to Yogi Mahajan, a high-ranking Sahaja Yoga world leader whose authority superseded the principles. Yogi Mahajan responded immediately. Sir Raja was dismissed, and the students could breathe a collective sigh of relief. Or so they thought. Shortly thereafter, several students were taken to Diwali to worship. Upon arrival, they were shocked to see Sir Raja seated beside Sri Mataji. Miles saw the two together and immediately ran back to the tent, scared, confused, and hurt. Sri Mataji later reinstated Sir Raja to the school. When the students confronted their teachers, they were told that Raja had not done any of these perverted things, that they had been made up by the sex-obsessed Western children 
who were a negative influence. It's unclear what Srimataji gained from reinstating Sir Raja, but when he returned, tensions rose. Lance recalls the teachers being far more hostile to the students. As the unofficial whistleblower, Miles was targeted for abuse. It became so unbearable that he left the school. Since graduation, Lance kept in touch with his classmates. Many of them, including Miles, no longer practice Sahaja Yoga. Despite these tragic stories, neither the children nor the parents have filed lawsuits. In fact, parents continued to send their children to India. There were a few reasons for this. The compliance Sri Mataji fostered among her disciples created a code of silence. Many parents had no idea what happened to their children, and the few who talked felt ashamed. Their children had failed due to inherited bad vibrations. It's also possible the Sahaja yogis were too consumed with their devotion to Sri Mataji to think of their children. Kramer and Ostad write, quote, Gurus can arouse intense emotions, as there is extraordinary passion in surrendering to what one perceives as a living God, end quote. In fact, the International Sahaja Public School remains open today. Miles wasn't the only one to face backlash for speaking out. On July 8, 1999, Sri Mataji gave a set of lectures at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Quote, People are just trying to mislead all the seekers who are truthful who are honest, who are innocent. She said, careful not to mention who those people were. On July 10th, two days later, a British ex-Sahaja yogi named Simon Dykin Munford decided to tell the seekers the truth about Sahaja Yoga. Munford stood outside the hall, handing out pamphlets, when four Sahaja yogis confronted him, trying to defame Munford to potential converts. When Munford wouldn't leave, the Sahaja yogis threatened him with violence. But Montford was not the only ex-yogi who experienced such harassment at the hands of Sri Mataji's followers. Sue, for instance, was attracted by the promise of a cure for her debilitating arthritis and heard stories of Sri Mataji's healing prowess. Still, she had doubts, largely because a lot of people claim to be alternative medicine healers, but are undoubtedly quacks. Desperation and curiosity, however, outweighed her cynicism. Sue went to a seminar with an open mind, a decision she regrets. She recalls having been led down the garden path in hindsight. The longer she stayed and the more Sue got to know Sahaja Yoga, the more her reservations grew with every revelation. Still, the Sahaja Yogis in her local chapter were friendly, kind-hearted folk. It was enough to make Sue put her fears aside. But one of the many red flags for Sue was the money. Sue was initially told that Sahaja Yoga was free. However, Sri Mataji was charging Sahaja Yogis about $250 each to camp out on her property in New York. The disciples were also instructed to purchase traditional Indian clothes, such as saris for the women. Failure to observe these rules would ruin the vibrations. Initially, Sue had been willing to pay the $250. She understood that all organizations need to raise money to support themselves, and truly, it wasn't such a large sum of cash. However, she was also told that Sahaja Yoga wasn't an organization, that they didn't even have a secretary. Like Sue, Cynthia also noticed the discrepancies. When Cynthia and Nick attended a seminar in the Catskills, they were stopped by a Sahaja Yogi who asked if they had paid yet. Caught off guard, Cynthia admitted they hadn't. The Sahaja Yogi shouted that no one was to go into the cabin without paying the registration fee, slamming his hand on a table for emphasis. With all eyes on her, a trembling Cynthia produced a check. The Sahaja Yogi wouldn't take it. He wanted cash, which Cynthia didn't have on her at the time. She was guided to a separate area of the cabin where several others sat on the floor wrapped in blankets. There was no heat and Cynthia had no blanket. She shivered as the others meditated to a photo of Sri Mataji. Sri Mataji, who had promised free enlightenment, conveniently forgot to mention how much free cost. Please note that the following figures are calculated in U.S. currency. In just a year, Sri Mataji earned anywhere from $710,475 to about $1.9 million on puja ceremonies. 
annual tours of India earned an approximate 346,500 to 695,000 dollars. Fees for school, music academy, and youth camp fetched about 349,000 to 611,750 dollars. Rent for staying in any of Sri Mataji's ashrams netted about 226,800 to 691,200 dollars. Sales of audio and video cassette tapes totaled on average from 113,141 to 451,390 dollars. Treatment at a Belapur hospital in India, also known as Sri Mataji Hospital, earned 504,000 to 1,104,000. It's interesting that Sri Mataji would open a hospital for Sahaja yogis since, according to her seminars, their spiritual energy should have been able to heal their ailments. Finally, the fees for the mass arranged marriages, held twice a year in Kabela Ligure and Ganpatipule, India, went for $9,375 to $15,000. In total, Sri Mataji's estimated income from Sahaja Yoga was valued from $2.3 million to $5.5 million annually. And that was just the beginning. We'll return to our story in just a moment. And now let's continue our story. By 1985, Sahaja Yoga had gone from a bare-bones movement to a full-blown religion, earning an estimated $5.5 million annually. It made that money by taking advantage of its members and squeezing them for all their disposable income. However, this estimate is incomplete. Donations to international tours, real estate donations, expensive gifts handpicked by Sri Mataji, unpaid loans, and shopping bills as well as the proceeds from videos of public broadcasts, audio cassettes of Sahaja Yogi music, CDs, literature, photographs, chakra charts, and vibrated goods, or gold bangles and herbs for alternative medicine, were unaccounted for in this calculation. The concept ties back to why diehard fans buy merchandise featuring their favorite stars, objects made extraordinary through association. Kramer and Alstad compare the celebrity-fan relationship and the guru-disciple relationship in terms of how both sides feed each other. They said successful gurus, rock stars, charismatic leaders of any sort experience the intensity of adulation amplified beyond most people's ken. Adulation has powerful emotions for the sender as well. For the Sahaja yogis, the expense was worth their superficial bond with Sri Mataji. Concerns about the money eventually got back to Sri Mataji, and the Italian Sahaja Yoga Finance Committee issued an email on September 19, 1999, assuring followers that Sahaja Yoga doors were open for everyone, regardless of income. They rationalized that sometimes visitors who are sinful, hypocritical cheats will publish hurtful things about Sri Mataji in an effort to harm the movement and should be ignored. The committee provided a list of the movement's many houses, ashrams, hospitals, and schools as proof that the money was going to Sahaja Yoga and not into Sri Mataji's pockets. They reasoned that this is where the money was going, not to Sri Mataji herself. The ex-Sahaja yogis responded with an email on September 20th, 1999. They accused Sri Mataji of inventing the committee. The language in the statement matched her speech pattern. They also argued that it would be in character for Sri Mataji to invent a committee, as she has previously signed her letters with far-fetched authors, such as all the Sahaja Yogis of the world. There were several questions the ex-Sahaja Yogis had for the committee. Who were the members? When were they hired? How were they selected? The ex-disciples also noted that while the properties had been purchased for Sahaja Yoga, the real problem was whether Sri Mataji owned these properties. The ex-disciples also noticed that the list of properties was missing the Castle Palazzo Doria in Cabela Ligure. How many more properties did Sri Mataji neglect to mention? They called her out on this. If the properties are in Sri Mataji's name and she has not made arrangements for them to pass on to the Sahaja Yogis when she dies, 
then we would certainly expect her to spend her own money. Meanwhile, Montford redoubled his efforts. On October 18, 1999, he anonymously registered the domain sahaja-yoga.org. The website encouraged other ex-Sahaja yogis to come forward, albeit in secret. Having been harassed and slandered, Montford knew why many ex-disciples feared Sri Mataji. It was accidentally stumbling upon sahaja-yoga.org that convinced disciples like Sue to hastily retreat from the movement. Initially, the departing Sahaja yogis didn't seem to concern Sri Mataji. On December 25, 1999, during a Christmas celebration, she reiterated that they always had a choice. There's no oppression in Sahaja Yoga. It's your free will by which you come in. For every disciple that left, there were more waiting in the wings. Cults need a continuous stream of recruits and potential converts to reinforce the belief that they're where it's at. The new millennium would mark a turning point for Sri Mataji and Sahaja Yoga. On February 28, 2000, Baba Mama died. The loss was likely devastating for Sri Mataji and may have also caused her to reconsider the ex-Sahaja Yogis. Her speech on March 5, 2000 had taken on an apocalyptic tone. Natural disasters and other maladies would plague the world. Sri Mataji warned that the destruction of the world was impending. She reassured her disciples that they were safe because they were under the protection of their mother. On April 18, 2000, an email appeared from the European Sahaja Yogis to address the discrepancies listed on sahaja-yoga.org. The fiscal problems were the third point addressed in their message. The counter-argument began, quote, who said we need no money? Any project in a material world needs material resources. Will they deny us the right to raise these resources?" End quote. The email also implied that the ex-disciples' criticisms sprung from sour grapes. Quote, when someone has tasted paradise and then loses it by his or her own fault, this person must justify his or her error and redefine the whole landscape to fit this existential blunder. End quote. They also accused the ex-disciples of cowardice and insecurity. Kramer and Alstad write, core members of the group have a huge vested interest in believing in the guru, as their identity is wrapped up believing in the guru's righteousness. Perhaps this willful disillusionment is what helped Sri Mataji retain membership in the face of these accusations. In fact, in her speech on February 25, 2001, Sri Mataji sounded carefree. She told her disciples that those who had real spirituality would always be protected. It seemed as though she was ready to move on from the ex-disciples. However, someone in Sahaja Yoga still saw the ex-disciples as a credible threat. On February 26, 2001, sahaja-yoga.org received an email from Sahaja Yoga's Swiss Association. It was a demand to scrub sahaja-yoga.org from the internet within three days or face legal action. The ex-Sahaja yogis replied on February 28th, stating that their site was meant to inform outsiders about Sahaja Yoga, and they offered to correct any factual errors the Swiss Association found. On March 1st, the Swiss Associate wrote back, if the ex-disciples refuse to take sahaja-yoga.org down or transfer the domain to Sahaja Yoga, they would move forward with the complaint. Montford, the face of the ex-disciples, had been threatened with divine retribution, damnation, and lawsuits. He and the others had never backed down before and refused to give in. Days later, the ex-Sahaja yogis were notified that Sahaja Yoga had filed a complaint with the World Intellectual Property Organization's Arbitration and Mediation Center. The complaint outed Montford as the domain registrant. As he and the other ex-disciples awaited the WIPO decision, Montford debated Sahaja yogis online. In an email exchange dated from April 29th to May 5th, 2001, Montford corresponded with a Sahaja yogi named Mayank about Sri Mataji's finances. Another ex-disciple asked Mayank about the secrecy. Why were Sahaja yogis told not to disclose too much information to the new recruits? Why weren't the colleges where the seminars were held told other religious aspects? 
if Sri Mataji was really the Adi Shakti, or the primordial energy, then why were the Sahaja yogis ordered to hide the truth? Wouldn't she want people to know? Mayank countered that many had witnessed Sri Mataji's miracles. Again, Montford was sympathetic. Like Mayank, he too once believed that Sri Mataji had all the answers. On June 16, 2001, the WIPO announced their decision. Sahaja Yoga's claim on the domain name sahaja-yoga.org was denied. The panel found that Sahaja Yoga didn't have the rights to the term Sahaja Yoga, as the term came from a variety of sources that were around centuries before Sri Mataji started her movement. The unintended consequence was that the ex-disciples' claims were verified. The WIPO had found that Sahaja Yoga neglected to disclose to their followers that the true purpose of the movement was for disciples to worship Sri Mataji as the creator of the universe. Additionally, they found that several European countries had listed Sahaja Yoga as a dangerous cult. The ex-disciples had a small taste of victory, but it didn't last. Later that year, Sahaja Yoga commenced Project 2800. It was a plan for Sahaja Yogis worldwide to register pro-Sahaja Yoga websites. Their goal was to flood the internet with websites that would appear on the first page of Google or Yahoo search results. The ex-disciples' websites would sink to the bottom, as a potential recruit would likely browse the top results first. As for Sri Mataji, the fights between her current and former disciples were likely taking a toll on her health. Kramer and Alstad say, gurus and disciples need each other, but as roles, not as individuals, which makes real human connection impossible. On December 31, 2001, Sri Mataji told her congregation that her health was beginning to fail. Sri Mataji continued to decline in the coming years. Her public speaking tours decreased until July 20, 2008, when Sri Mataji announced her retirement at age 85. With that, Sri Mataji gave her final blessing. On July 30, 2008, Sri Mataji gathered enough strength to meet in private with the World Council for the Advancement of Sahaja Yoga in Cabela Ligure to create a committee that would take over in the wake of her death. She reportedly left the meeting in anger. What set her off remains a mystery. Perhaps Sri Mataji felt overwhelmed at the number of people waiting for her to kick the bucket. Sri Mataji passed away in Genoa, Italy on February 23, 2011. Several Sahaja yogis were in denial about the death of their goddess. They believed Sri Mataji had been drugged, which sent her to an early grave. An online petition demanding justice for Sri Mataji didn't achieve its signature goal, but its comments illustrate her post-mortem influence. A Sahaja yogi wrote, She is not physically with us, but she will always be with us. Sahaja Yoga announced the Awareness in Using Media initiative on February 21, 2012. This would preserve Sri Mataji's legacy with social media. A quote from the document says, It is our duty to act responsibly and make our Divine Mother proud of us. Honoring Sri Mataji means keeping new recruits ill-informed. It also means Sahaja Yogis shouldn't engage with troublemakers online. The strategy seems to have worked, as the ex-disciples have petered out. With over 2,200 centers in 75 countries today, Sahaja Yoga thrives thanks to its clandestine nature. So the next time a friend request or a random pop-up ad promotes what seems to be a free meditation seminar located nearby, remember this. In her lifetime, Sri Mataji claimed to embody the qualities of a Hindu goddess, this includes Mahamaya, or the Great Illusion, and given the nature of illusions, nothing is what it seems. Thanks again for tuning in to Cults. We'll be back with another episode next Tuesday. Some of you have asked how you can help the show. If you enjoy Cults, the best way to help is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can find Cults and all of ParCast's podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, CastBox, TuneIn, or on your favorite podcast directory. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram as at ParCast and Twitter at ParCast Network. 
We'll see you next time. Cults was created by Max Cutler and is a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It is produced by Max and Ron Cutler, sound designed by Carrie Murphy, with production assistance by Ron Shapiro and Paul Mahler. Additional production assistance by Maggie Admire and Carly Madden. Cults is written by Simone Fournilier and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. And here it is, your preview of mythology's first episode on the Greek goddess Athena. I hope you like it. It was foolish to challenge the gods. After battling the goddess Athena for three days, Enceladus had all but resigned himself to the fate of so many of his fellow giants. But he'd escaped her for the moment, and perhaps that would become his advantage. Enceladus had barely caught his breath when he heard the horses. He whipped around, worried Athena had tracked him to the Ionian Sea, but it was one of Enceladus' own, another giant. As the giant grew closer, Enceladus realized something was wrong. Instead of legs, Enceladus and his brother giants slithered on two large serpents with snapping maws where the feet should be. But this giant's serpents weren't snapping, and its face sagged. An arrow whizzed past Enceladus' face. This wasn't a giant. It was a god. You foolish, foolish giant. No one rebels against the gods and escapes unscathed. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, peeled off the face of a giant she'd flayed alive, revealing her own face dripping with blood. She kept the skin wrapped around her like a cloak. Enceladus's leg serpents snapped and spit at Athena, but their fangs couldn't pierce the hide of his own kind. It was a perfect shield. Athena knocked Enceladus into the Ionian Sea. Then she crouched down and lifted the entire isle of Sycalos. Athena had a divine, godly strength, Plucking an island out of the ocean was as easy for her as it was for a man to pick up his child. Athena straightened up, raising the island above her. She swung it around over Enceladus and slammed the island on his head. Enceladus crumpled under the blow of the island. He sank and then vanished beneath the landmass. His blood and anger rippled outward from the island. The place where Enceladus was defeated became Mount Etna, and the buried giant was reduced to expressing his wrath through eruptions and earthquakes. Yet something wasn't right. As she watched steam build above Mount Etna, Athena knew her heart was missing a piece. She'd used her wisdom and wit to defeat the enemy, embracing her role as a goddess of war, and it felt empty. She was destined for something greater, she was certain. Welcome to Mythology on the Parcast Network. Every Tuesday we present dramatic stories from ancient mythology and explore their origins. I'm your host and narrator, Vanessa Richardson. Today we're focusing on the Greek goddess Athena. She's the goddess of war and military strategy, but also the goddess of wisdom, civilization, and the arts. In her mythology, she's caught between who she is and who she wants to be. New episodes of Mythology release every Tuesday, and you can find us and all of Parcast's podcasts wherever you listen to podcasts. At Parcast, we are grateful for you, our listeners. You allow us to do what we love. Let us know how we're doing. Reach out on Facebook and Instagram at Parcast and Twitter at Parcast Network. And if you enjoy today's episode, the best way to help us is to leave a five-star review wherever you're listening. It really does help us. We also now have merchandise. Head to Parcast.com slash merch for more information. Something to note in these episodes, all Greek myths have many versions and variations. We've selected those we felt are the most dramatic and entertaining, and supplemented them with additional research into Greek traditions. 
Additionally, each Greek myth takes place in a wide expanded universe. While we'll cover some major myths of Athena over the next few episodes, this won't be her only appearance in the podcast. Goddess of the arts and of war, Athena exhibits a dichotomy in Greek culture. She's a woman warrior in a culture where women didn't go to war, and a household goddess who vowed to never be a lover or a mother. Athena is masculine, feminine, and something greater than both. She's a goddess for everyone, and a goddess for no one. Ancient Greek society had clear gender roles, treating women as second-class citizens. But Athena exists outside that construct. She'll skin a giant alive, and then go weave a tapestry. She's as apt to teach men gardening and pottery as she is to help them slay their enemies. Unlike her half-brother and rival, Ares, the war god, Athena approaches war with logic and meditation. At the start of a battle, Ares leaps into action, while Athena waits, plans, then leads men to bloody victory. She values rational thinking over emotion, but is not without rage and bloodlust. Classicist Walter F. Otto characterized Athena as the goddess of nearness because she was always beside the Greek heroes in battle, guiding their spears and swords. She is, like all Greek gods, a killer. However, Athena prefers to change errant humans into other forms, doling out punishments while preserving life. She also transforms herself, taking a male appearance multiple times in the Iliad and the Odyssey. That isn't to say she doesn't embrace a female role, too. In today's myths, the building of the Palladium, the judgment of Paris, and the story of Arachne, Athena strives to be recognized as feminine, and this may be the hardest battle the goddess of war has ever fought. The king of the gods had a headache, and Zeus's son Hephaestus, like many children, was only making it worse. Hephaestus was god of the forge, born with a club foot. To him, a headache was nothing. And then I realized I could put another axe head on my existing axe and kill two men with one blow. Genius, right? Oh, my head is killing me. That's the idea. Both heads could kill. Two heads, one axe. Zeus gestured to his forehead, frustrated. It feels like my skull is expanding and contracting. Maybe I should go... Oh, oh headache. I thought we were still on axe heads. Zeus continued moaning as he dropped to the floor, gripped his head, and rocked back and forth. Hephaestus looked on, torn between sympathy and opportunity. Anything I can do? Maybe take over your duties for a time? Not that a headache could ever take down the great god Zeus. Oh, Hephaestus, will you... Hephaestus eyed his brand new double-headed axe. Then Zeus doubled over in front of him. The opportunity was ripe. Zeus had overthrown Hephaestus' grandfather. Perhaps patricide ran in the family. Oh, make it stop. End it. I'll cut off my head. Hephaestus hid his grin as he grabbed his double-head axe. After today, the gods of Mount Olympus would bow to Hephaestus. He wound up and aimed straight for Zeus's skull. The axe cleaved Zeus's head in half. As Zeus's eyes spread wide apart, a battle helmet emerged from where his brain should have been. Ah! Hephaestus dropped his axe in shock as a fully armored warrior woman sprang from Zeus's head, shouting a battle cry. All thoughts of ruling Mount Olympus faded in the face of this fearsome, beautiful goddess. Ready for battle, Athena stepped out of her father's head and into the light of Mount Olympus. Athena was born without a mother, the child of Zeus alone. She emerged a rational adult, capable of complex thought, and ready to fight for her life. Yet because the Greek gods are modeled on humans, with human flaws and emotions, 
There is one story of Athena's childhood and a youthful accident that guided the rest of her life. Zeus was accustomed to his children having a mother, so after he fused his head back together, he wasn't sure what to do with Athena. Eventually, the single dad sent his new daughter away to be educated by his nephew, Triton. Triton was a fish-tailed ocean god, so Athena spent much of her time in and around water, and more of her time with Triton's daughter, Pallas. Pallas was a water nymph, a maiden of the ocean, and Athena's only friend. But today, the war goddess and the water nymph raised their swords, squaring off against each other. The pair sparred on the surface of a lake. Pallas floated amid a column of waves, her long hair and shimmering fishtail distracting from her killer aim. Athena defended herself from atop a sleek raft, wearing armor as always. She pushed her sword forward, calling out her moves as she executed them. Striking, stabbing, dodging, ducking, and slicing, lunging. As Pallas lunged, Athena used her shield to knock Pallas over. Rising from the waves, Pallas spit water into Athena's face. Hey! (laughs) Pallas spouted more water, somehow forming it into perfect concentric circles, like aquatic smoke rings. Athena couldn't help but laugh. Pallas, be serious. My father's coming to watch us spar tomorrow. We have to impress him. You have to impress him. If I impress him, you know where I'll end up. And my father won't be happy about that. You're filthy. You've heard the stories, and you have a hundred half-siblings to prove it. Thirty-seven. I have thirty-seven half-siblings. That's an army, warrior goddess. Let's go again. I want to get that spinning parry right. Athena was quite skilled in combat. It helped that she took to it naturally, like palace to water. She'd been ecstatic to hear Triton declare that they were finally good enough to spar in front of Zeus. The proud fathers had invited a crowd of gods, nymphs, and even a few mortals they fancied. Rowing out onto the lake, Athena fiddled with her helmet. She knew her armor made her look ferocious, but she still felt like a child in a woman's body. What if she fell off her raft? What if her mind went blank and she froze? What if her father, the king of the gods, thought she was only average? A terrifying column of water arose from the depths. Inside it, Pallas. She met Athena's eye and flashed a quick smile. Athena relaxed. She wasn't alone. She had Pallas. With her best friend beside her, Athena had nothing to worry about. They began to spar. In the audience, Zeus watched intently. Next to him, his wife Hera, the goddess of marriage, looked around, intent in a different way. Aphrodite has such a nice nose, don't you think? Sure. That's it. Slice and dodge. Well done. You've never noticed it? I guess it's fine, if you like noses. It looks quite like Athena's. Don't start on this again. I don't understand why you- She's going to fall in the water. A wave crashed over Athena, soaking her. Athena slipped, but kept her footing on the raft. Come on, Athena. You can do it. Get back up there. Raise that sword. You'll win this yet. They aren't actually fighting. It's a mock spar. At the end of which, my daughter will win. Zeus nervously watched Athena struggle through the next few maneuvers. She's going to fall and embarrass us. Us? She does have a mother. I knew it. I meant Athena and myself. As Zeus worried, Athena relaxed into the rhythm of the spar. She breathed deeply as she pressed her shield against Pallas's sword. Her instincts took over. Suddenly, a new heat rushed through Athena's veins. She'd never felt this warrior power before, but it possessed her. Her feet danced more nimbly. Her sword twisted more sharply. She tasted metal in her mouth. For the first time, she might want to kill. Across the lake, Zeus adjusted his shield. The sun gleamed off of it. 
getting an idea, he tilted his shield, aiming the ray of light at Pallas. In the water, the light caught Pallas's eye. She looked up. Meanwhile, Athena stabbed toward Pallas's heart, a final flourish, the perfectly executed move she was born for. This was her gift, combat. Athena lunged, expecting Pallas to dodge as they had rehearsed. She didn't notice that Pallas's face was tilted up, distracted. Pallas looked toward Zeus as Athena's sword pierced her heart. Instead of blood, water flowed from Pallas's wound. She shrank, dissolving, until all that was left were her eyes, which transformed into two wiggling minnows. Pallas was dead. If you enjoyed listening to this preview of our episode on Athena and want to hear the rest of it, search and subscribe to Mythology wherever you listen to podcasts. New episodes release every Tuesday.